North Carolina certainly has its share of legends and lore. So this rock, we kind of understand now that it actually is a boundary marker between this world and the spirit world. We explore mysteries like the Roan Mountain Ghost Choir. So when the hotel was up on this hill, people said that they could hear that. It sounded like a choir or voices. And voices, yes. Even some Bigfoot sightings and places created just for your imagination. Oz has a huge fan following. It's all on my home, coming up next. All across the state, we're uncovering the unique stories that make North Carolina my home. I've always had an interest in the paranormal. Everybody was okay with that. Everyone had a ghost story they heard from their mother or their grandmother or something. The brown mountain lights, the Macon light. North Carolina's full of legends and all these other things. Once we start talking about Bigfoot, then we cross the crazy line. <laughs> now we're in the world of being abducted by aliens. Everyone's got ghost tours. Very, very few places have Bigfoot stories, let alone stuff happening right now. My name is Stephen Barcello. I'm a commissioner in the town of Littleton, North Carolina, and we are at the Cryptozoology Paranormal Museum, which I run. Cryptozoology is a study of uh, creatures not proven to science. Bigfoot, Jersey Devil, Mothman, things of that sort. I'm telling the stories of things that have been around here for well over 100 years, and people seem to be enjoying the heck out of it. Tell us what you saw. I know I saw Bigfoot. Did it scare you? <laughs> no. Now since I've been here, and I've only lived here eight years, I've had four separate sightings on Moore Street. Bigfoot, we're not sure exactly what it is. Now we have a lot of folks that come in here to feel they're interdimensional or they're uh, tied to UFOs. Uh, you know, basically it's sort of like the alien's pet. <laughs> Personally, I lean towards the fact that these things are flesh and blood. This is the closest we've got to what they're seeing in here. Now, these things are seen moving family pods. It's not just one creature. So you have some of the large, big prints that have got the splayed toes. And you can see some are just downright kind of odd looking, almost alien looking. As far as casting the prints, uh, we actually sell the material in the museum. We have Bigfoot go bags, we have evidence kits, and then of course we give you information on places to go in the area so you can go out and do your own investigating. Uh, it's amazing how many people have come out and never done this. Once they get into it, they're hooked. <laughs> they're done. And next, you know, they're explaining to their wives why they're dropping, you know, $800 for a flare scope and <laughs> buy this equipment. We go out, you know, myself, Johnny, George, we take it very serious. We'll go camping, and we're not there to camp. We're, we're there to investigate all night long. And we've caught some amazing stuff. I mean, just look at that. I mean, you just do kind of a general scan. There's no way you're gonna miss a person or a creature out there. In here, it's up in here where I got that. They came up, I had the parabolic dish that I could hear movement. And then with the scope, I could see some heat once in a while. And I figured it was a deer or something like that. And then all of a sudden I could see it was upright. It just looked too big. It was moving too smoothly in the dark with no headlamp. It's either a Bigfoot or a really big naked camper. I guess the moral of the story is don't give up. There's a whole nother world just around the corner that we generally don't see. We're just telling the stories. This, this rock is many things all at one time. I don't think there's any better way to illustrate what it means, not just for me, but for all of us as Cherokees. This speaks to the strength and tenacity in the persistence of the Cherokee people in this landscape, in this place. It is a part of the story of who we are. It is a definer of what is being a Cherokee. 
people just called it that, that Indian rock. So now there's about 10,000 people a year come here. It's really a mixture of science and art. My name is Scott Ashcraft. I'm a Forest Service archaeologist for the Pisgah National Forest, but I'm also a co-director of the North Carolina Rock Art Project. When it comes to general petroglyphs, this is a very, very big one, not just for Western North Carolina, but for the Eastern U.S. It's the most densely carved that we know of. It is one of the most important places to the Cherokee people. It's a form of communication in some ways. So what, what is this story? What are they trying to tell? First of all, there is the namesake of the rock itself, Judicula, uh, one of the Cherokee's um, spirit beings, a giant. Well, there's his handprint um, that has a story behind it. And then the long line, one story is that he did it with his nail, and it represents a boundary. We think it's also a map of not only this local area, but also a map for the spirit world. My name is Jerry Parker, and my family has been living here, property where the Judicola Rock is, since the 1850s. For lack of a better description, we have been the caretakers or stewards of this property. How many acres? Is There's 100, 133 acres that my father made the reason he wanted to, uh, to preserve the rock. See, he transferred the rock to the county in 1959. This is my grandfather in 1932 or three. Okay. Like that, and that's his cornfield behind me. Okay, yeah. So the rock was surrounded by the cornfield. What's your grandfather's name? His name was Miles. Miles. My grandfather's name I was like Miles. But here is the color postcard. Oh, wow. That they, yeah. that picture originally comes from. I've traveled many places over the world, but I always come back here. And so I look at this as my spiritual lodestone that sort of just brings me back. My name is Thomas Bell, and my home is at Koala Boundary, North Carolina. This region is our ancestral home. I am the Cherokee Language Program Coordinator at Western Carolina University. Cherokee, the word is pronounced Jutala. The rock is 10,000 years old. It tells me who I am. It tells me where I'm from. It's possible to put the entire rock into motion. Yeah. yeah. I'm Brett Riggs. I'm the Sequoia Distinguished Professor of Cherokee Studies at Western Carolina University. This is a spot that embodies Cherokee belief and embodies the Cherokee belonging to this place. It's true, I thought we are from here. This is us. You've got the line, and, and then you have the handprint under the line. And Shukala, when he, when he jumps, he leaves one world and he comes into another world. To me, that's what makes this thing so special. This is the linkage that comes right up to the present. It gives me a place on the face of the earth that I've been granted to share with my relatives. It tells me that I'm home. For centuries, many have passed down stories of hearing strange, eerie noises on the top of Roan Mountain at the Tennessee-North Carolina border. Now scientists, folklorists, and historians come together to try to find out what makes up the choir-like singing that many hear. If the mountain music or the ghost choir was heard, the wind was blowing very hard. People had um, reported 
great fear. I just love this mountain. It's actually a part of my soul. Roan Mountain, to me, is an incredibly spiritual place. When you're on top of the Rhone, your cares just lift. My name is Jennifer Bauer, and I've lived in Roan Mountain for 38 years. The state park is all down at this elevation. Um, the top of the Rhone is all National Forest Service. At Rhone Mountain State Park, my primary job responsibilities were to do programs. Over the years that I've worked here, I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people whose parents, grandparents worked in the Cloudland Hotel in the late 1800s, which was a time where reports of the mountain music and the ghost choir uh, were talked about. It was huge. And everyone is dressed up so fancy to be on the mountain. I know. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. That's great. All in these beautiful clothes up here on top of the road. So right here where we're standing, we're on the Appalachian Trail. Uh -huh. Behind me is North Carolina, and in front of us is Tennessee. During the Cloudland Hotel days, um, General Wilder, who built the Cloudland Hotel, most likely was getting more and more reports of people getting trapped out in storms, hearing these strange and eerie sounds. I found lots of references to strong wind when I was doing research on Rome Mountain. So when the hotel was up on this hill, people said that they could hear that ghost choir. Some people felt that that mountain music, that strange, eerie sound that would whip around the mountains, were fairies. Um, other people thought that the mountain music came from the spirits of Cherokee and Catawba Indians who many, many years ago fought on top of the Rhone. So other people felt that what they were hearing was the mountain actually talking to them. But some people took them as very evil messages and they felt like the devil himself had come up from the depths below um, to find them. Other people felt the music was not evil at all. The ghost choir, the mountain music, they felt it was the sounds of angels, that the Rome was so blessed. So in an effort to determine what might be affecting guests at the Clowlin Hotel, I do not know if General Wilder requested that scientist Henry Colton from Knoxville come to the hotel to find out, but he was there. Mr. Colton had come to do some investigations of a sort to figure out what this was. So were they on their, the balconies, or how were how, how they know, situated? that was never really explained. They could have been walking. They could have been standing on the porch. I think they were just more out and about in this area. And that was going to hurt his business, because people were getting scared to come to the <laughs> hotel. It's possible. Yeah. And ultimately, uh, Mr. Colton determined that the sounds were being made by friction and electricity generated by friction, usually at the narrowest ridges. Now, we don't know that that's the answer, but that was the scientific approach to finding out why so many people were frightened <laughs> when they were out during these serious storms. And now, if we get to hear the ghost choir, that's going to really be a plus. I know. <laughs> well, there's no storms. Have to be a storm. The folks that lived here then, you know, were very, very isolated. I can imagine that sometimes fear could be a big part of a person's life.
So where are we going now? Well, we must go into the storm cellar because there's a storm coming. Okay. A twister. I've heard. <laughs> so I've heard. Pay no attention to that woman behind the curtain. <laughs> What's behind the curtain? We don't know. Oh my goodness. There's a storm. It's oh just my goodness. A Well, good morning and welcome to Oz. Are you ready to follow the Yellow Brick Road? Are you going to click your heels when you get up there? We are. If you have to go home? We are. We, we came all the way from Florida. We actually saw an advertisement on Facebook for it, and so we looked it up. Tickets sold out in 15 seconds, but, you know, we were lucky and got them, so... <laughs> Flying monkeys would be awesome, but... <laughs> They're probably not going to be there. <laughs> I hope you don't see flying monkeys yeah. today. That's, that would be a little disturbing. <laughs> Last call, 11.30 tour through Oz. Who rang that bell? Nobody gets in to see the wizard, not nobody, not know how. Do you know your line? No. Okay. But I'm Dorothy <laughs> from Kansas. I'm gonna have to do better. What do you think, Munchkin? So far, so good? My name is Cindy Keller, and my home is in Kansas. This is the Land of Oz, or the Kansas portion of the Land of Oz on Beach Mountain. As mayor of the Munchkin City in the county and the land of Oz, I wish to welcome you most regally. And we're all here to verify it legally. I came here 20 something years ago to help with the development of this property. I am caretaker or self-appointed title of the Keeper of Oz. We gotta get away. We've gotta run away quick. Oh, hello. Oh, In the 1970s, it was a little mom and pops theme park that brought jobs and opportunity. The Land of Oz was in operation from 1970 to 1980. It was created by the same family that ran Tweetsie Railroad. Mr. Robbins, Grover Robbins, passed away six months before the park opened. He had to have a lot of gumption, I would imagine. Well, I, the word that I have heard him described as a number of times was visionary. We'll gaze into the crystal. This is our third summer doing the Family Fun Fridays. Now, why are you running away? You will take the chairlift, as you did in the 1970s, to the top of the mountain, and you will be greeted at the old Fountain of Youth. Well, there were a number of artifacts purchased from MGM back in 1969. We've got little munchkin slippers. We have the gatekeeper's cloak thing that probably stands out in more people's minds than anything is, is the cyclone. This is the original 1970s film that was made for here in the park. They remember going in and getting disoriented and tossed into a, uh, an upside down house. Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. We must be over the rainbow. There are 44,000 yellow bricks, I am told. They were made in Winston-Salem, and they were glazed and fired four or five times to give them the enamel. I mean, when the sun hits those yellow bricks, it, it, it's quite impressive, you know. Do you see that? That's how much longer you've got to be alive. And it isn't long, my pretty. I use the word hokey, but 
I've grown to appreciate the word hokey. People like simple things and family things. I would hope that at the end of the day that everyone has sung a happy song and leaves with a smile on their face. If you've traveled down Highway 12, you've probably seen something out of this world in Frisco, North Carolina. It's called the Frisco UFO or the Futuro House, and it has a very unique story. It's the second most photographed thing in Dare County. And the other, only other thing is the lighthouse itself. It's just obscure. Why is it there? What possessed somebody to do what they did? What makes him dress up like an alien, you know? Something different, and who owns a spaceship, you know? Like, who does? My name is Leroy Reynolds. Just an old man. I'm the owner of the Futuro House. I call it the Frisco UFO spaceship. Been being the alien probably since 96. I had a racing suit from when I used to race cars, and I thought, well, that's alien green, you know? All he needs is a mask. I would wait till people were out here taking pictures and slip down out of the door and sit down behind them. You know, just, just for fun, you know. You believe in aliens? Hmm. Everybody always liked the spaceship. It's just different. Did you have any alien friends back on Tron? Of course. Everybody that comes here after they leave, they're smiling. You, they come here crappy and they leave smiling. I love that it's just like, that it's unique. Yeah, well, you, we drove past it. We didn't know, we just thought it was a UFO attraction. Yeah. Like, oh, you guys want to see the Futuro House? And you're like, oh yeah, you know, because there's a bunch in Texas, I guess. You drove by, but you have seen this before. Where have you seen this before? I saw this, uh, it was either in the late 60s or early 70s in Playboy magazine. Okay. It was sold in Playboy magazine in 1972. Had a six page spread. It was the ultimate bachelor's pad. You attach your helicopter to it. My name is James Bagwell, like a bag in a well. I own the property and we brought the Futuro house down here. And, but Leroy runs it now. Now I guess it's ours. And I told him it's gonna be a legacy if it's anything. This was on the oceanfront in Hatteras as an oceanfront cottage, and then it was moved into Hatteras Village as a Girl Scout, Boy Scout uh, location. And then it was taken to Frisco Campground as a hot dog, hamburger, alien out of this world. But it's been down here for over 50 years. And a lot of people have a lot of memories about it. There's some kind of alien connection, and it is a hoot. It just pulls people in. Come down, you see it falling apart, and you're like, hey, I can't, I can't deal with it. I'd rather see it gone than falling apart. So you want to spruce it up and make it the legacy? Yep, I want to do something big with it, not something little. We would like to fix it up back to what it was and allow people to go back inside, just look at it. We're dickering with the county over that now. I would like to turn it into a museum of the arts. When, when they stop here, they'll say why, and I'll go, why not? And the other question is, do you believe? 
It had to do with believe in yourself, believe in you can do this. It'll be a legacy if you're doing something and giving back to the community. That's kind of, you know, the alien thing. Next time on My Home, North Carolina is a haven for foodies and chefs. Their stories about barbecue, street food, hot dogs, and international fare will bring a smile to your face and quite possibly a rumble in your tummy. I appreciate it, bro. Thank you. It's good to see you again. It's all on My Home.